I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want to talk to you in this first message, the first war room message is closet Christians. Closet Christians. And those of you that have already seen this film know exactly where we're going with the war room. The closet Christians. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. If you're there, say amen. It says in God's word that Jesus' words are here written in red. He's telling us this morning that, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you today for the opportunity we have to gather here in your house. God, we've come into this place to worship you. And we've come into this place to receive your word. God, make it potent and powerful to our spirit this morning. God, I pray again that you take my stutter and my stammer. God, I, I give them to you. Jesus, help me to be able to easily convey your truth and your message to your people this morning. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You know, a lot of people will rail against closet Christians, you know? A lot of people will rail against Closet Christianity, what does that usually mean to us? Closet Christianity usually means that we're, we're hiding our faith, right? Well, in this War Room series, we're going to talk about that we, we need to be closet Christians. We need to be believers that would go into an inner room to be able to find a place where we can get away with the Lord, get away with God, and enter into a time of prayer, a few precious moments of prayer. Closet Christianity today is not going to be a bad thing. Oh, that all of us would be closet Christians these next three weeks as we understand the power of getting away with God. A couple of things as we understand this first point is what does your closet look like? What does your closet look like? Everybody's closet where they go to be away with God, everybody's closet is going to look differently. Some of us may have an actual closet, an, an inner room. We've got an inner room here up on the second floor where people can go and pray, and it's quiet in there. It's peaceful in there. They can come during the week and enjoy some serene moments. But what does your closet time look like? Elizabeth Jordan had chips in there, just eating it and drinking Cokes, and different things were going on. And it was not an environment that was conducive to prayer. So the first, time, first idea of this is the position of your body is important. I mean, your, your physical, literal body, how you pray is important. Some position that's, that's comfortable, okay? But yet, not conducive to distraction or sleepiness. My prayer closet is oftentimes, if it's not up there in the prayer room, sometimes if it's a warm morning, I'll go out and walk around. We've talked about that. I mentioned that in the past. I like walking around in a prayer field or I'll walk around Confluence Park on the trails. As, as long as nobody else is around, I like being in my private time while I walk. That's my prayer closet. My prayer closet is sometimes here in an inner room. My prayer closet sometimes outside, out in God's creation, walking around a field. What does your prayer closet look like? Is it, is it an environment that's conducive to prayer? Is it away from others, away from people? In the same stroke, sometimes we try to find ways to keep ourselves awake when we pray. <laughs> sometimes we, want, we worry about drifting off. Sometimes we think, man, I can only pray for three or four minutes and then I'm done. I'm, I'm done after four minutes because I can't think of anything else to say. Sometimes we'll bring in a hard wooden chair to sit on in order to encourage us to stay awake. But that's not necessarily a good thing either because then your unconscious mind will find reasons why not to go to the prayer room because it's not comfortable. You need to find a place that is conducive, friends, to prayer. It's important. And your different positions may change. Sometimes you may be on your knees. Sometimes you may be up walking around. Sometimes you may be in a nice, comfortable sofa. Sometimes you might be in your office. Some of us might be in our pickup truck. Where is your prayer closet? What does it look like? 
the prophet Daniel there in the Old Testament, he had, a, he had a prayer closet, didn't he? He had a place where he went to pray, and it was at his home. As he rose up the ranks of power there in Babylon, Daniel went to his home every day, two or three times a day, and his, he, had, he had a routine, didn't he? He opened up the windows towards Jerusalem, and he prayed, and he never changed from his routine. That's one of the best things you can do for your prayer life is getting into a routine. One of the best things you can do is pray consistently at the same time every day. That's one of the best prayer closets that you can develop. That's how, that's how you set it up. Develop a routine like Daniel. Even though the position of your body is important, the position of your heart and mind, friends, is more important. Your heart and your mind must be prepared for prayer. Prayer is communication and conversation with God. If your attitude and your mind is set on eating chips and drinking Cokes, then prayer is inhibited. Your prayer is inhibited. Getting an attitude of prayer and a mind of prayer involves maybe not being so much into listening to other music. It's hard to pray when you're listening to a lot of worldly music before you go in to pray. It's distracting. Your mind is on the lyrics of the, of the songs that you just listened to. If you're getting ready to pray, charge yourself up with godly music, with praise and worship, so that when you go into a time of prayer, your mind is on those lyrics. Your mind is already on God. Your mind is then set on His awesomeness, His holiness, your relationship and your communication. But if you go straight off the country station, right into prayer time, you will find it is more difficult to pray. I love country music as much as the next guy, but... If I'm going into my prayer time, I shy far away from secular music. I will not engage in that for an hour before I pray because I want my mind and my spirit to be set upon God. Friends, we've got to turn off the TV. Sometimes I've, I've tried to have prayer time in my recliner. And I put, put the TV on, but I mute it, right? Because muting it is okay. Your quiet time is not the TV being muted. I'm a, I'm a newsaholic. I always turn on the news and then I'll mute it because I'm always reading the things that scroll along the bottom. I like to be informed about what's going on, but I cannot pray. I cannot be engaged in an attitude and atmosphere of prayer if I'm constantly every five seconds, every 10 seconds looking up at the screen to see what's going on. I cannot do that. You cannot have the TV on mute and engage God in prayer. Likewise, you cannot have a radio on. You're going to engage God in prayer. You can have some praise and worship music on in the background. That's the greatest thing you can do. Put on a little CD and have it gently playing in the background. But even Christian radio will go on with commercials from time to time and announcements. And where does your mind go? Automatically into announcement mode. Automatically into the, the commercials. Even Christian radio, friends, is probably not the strongest place to get your mind engaged. Take a notepad in there with you. You got to take a notepad in there because you know your mind and the enemy is going to bring up stuff for you to think about too. Important stuff, meaningful stuff. While I'm praying here every Sunday morning at the altars, I'm thinking up about three different things that I need to do still yet this morning before I go into Sunday school, before I go into the pulpit. And I have to push those things, even though they're, they're needed and they're necessary to get done, I have to push those things from my mind. One of the things that I do in my prayer time is sometimes I'll take a, a notepad so that if something's brought to my mind right then, I'll, I'll write it down so I can go on. So I won't forget it because my mind is always worried about forgetting the important thing that just brought up. But that important thing just got me distracted from praying and communicating with God. So write it down real quick and then go on. Your mind will become conditioned then to pray to your Heavenly Father without ceasing after a time of that and practicing. It's like a muscle, friends. Sometimes we think of our prayer warriors that get up underneath the bench press and you stack on three plates on one side and three plates on the other and we're just going to do that. We go into a weight room and we see these big old muscle-bound guys and they're bench pressing 315 pounds and we think, oh yeah, I can do that. And we get up underneath that, that rack of weight and we take it off the rack and all of a sudden it cuts us in half, doesn't it? <laughs> it flattens us completely because we've not trained up to that weight. When we go into a weight room, we cannot be cowered by the great weightlifters and the great men and women of God that are around us. We've got to take it off at our ability and start working up every day on a routine and we build up. We build up to, come, to become powerful men and women of God in our prayer closets. 
If you think that if you're just now getting started into a prayer life or prayer journey and you're going to start at an hour, that's not going to happen. You will probably fall flat on your face. You need, to, you need to take the weight off the rack at a doable level for you where you're at. For some of you, that may be 10 minutes. You need to start with God for 10 minutes and build your way up. Build up your muscles. Build up your spiritual inner man and develop that conditioning. The third idea here is what does your closet time look like? It's not to be showy. Prayer is not to be showy. Jesus tells us that here in his scriptures, but neither are we to shrink from our faith in public. Amen? Prayer is not to be showy, but neither are we to shrink from our faith in public. Friends, in our American culture today, we still struggle with false piety. But we struggle in different ways than the people of the day. Jesus' people, the Jewish people of that day, they liked praying on the, prayer, on the corners. They liked praying out loud in the synagogues. And that kind of turned Jesus off a little bit. He didn't, he didn't, just like, he knew their, their hearts. And that's why Jesus said they received their, their, their reward in full. Their reward was to be seen. God says, I just want to get you alone with me. Just the two of us and let's have a conversation. Let's hang out for a little bit of prayer. Now, the Jews didn't really have a tradition of going out to the street corners to pray on the corners, but a lot of times they had hours of prayer. And so they would try to time it just right that they would be on a street corner when the bell would ring or essentially a bell would ring for prayer. You know, the Muslim people, they pray five times a day. If we could just get Christians to pray once a day, where would we be? The Muslims pray five times a day, the same time every day. It doesn't change. The rigidity of that system is a good thing because it gets you in an environment where you know when you're going to pray. The Jewish people also had that. They had times of prayer, and so they would time it. When that time of prayer would come, they would make sure that they were out in public to be seen by men so that they would pray out there and everybody would see them being very pious, being very faithful to their religiousness. And Jesus understood that. He knew what they were trying to do. And he gives the people an idea. He says, go into the inner closet. Let's have a conversation. Let's not be fake. Let's not be shallow. Let's have a conversation together. Friends, the prayer is not always going to stay in the, in the prayer room. Prayer is, is a living thing. It, prayer moves from the inner closet to the, out on, onto the streets sometimes. Just look at Pentecost. Just look at Pentecost. All the people were gathered together in that one upper room and they stayed and they prayed for several days before Pentecost took place and the Spirit of God fell. But when the Spirit of God fell, it poured out because Pentecost could not be contained in that upper room. It had to go out into the highways and the byways and the streets because Pentecostal prayer was designed to reach and witness to people about the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it was about, friends. It's not always going to be contained. It's not always showy. But Daniel, there also, he, he opened up his windows to Jerusalem. It wasn't to be showy, but that was his prayer culture. That was the way he did it. That was his routine. Just because a law was passed by the government that says you can no longer pray in private, Daniel still did it. You can't change your routine. Once you develop a routine, stick with it. The second thing today I want to talk to you about is a desperate prayer. Prayers of desperation. Gentlemen, if you are married, you cannot go out to eat in public with another woman by yourself. That's just not kosher. It opens a door for, for rumors. That opens a door for people to think the worst. And in this case, in this case that you saw here, the worst was happening. The worst was taking place. Men of God, you have got to guard your hearts and you've got to guard your marriages. If you're going out to eat meals and, and you're a married man and you're going to go eat with uh, another woman, you need to take somebody with you. You need to take a man with you. You need to take another individual with you, somebody there that can be your accountability partner. Okay, if you're married, you cannot compromise yourself in such a way as that. You've got to guard your heart and guard your reputation. It, it, it's huge. What we're dealing with sometimes right now in the assemblies, we got uh, a lot of uh, single female missionaries coming, uh, wanting coffee. They want to engage us during the week. They get to mark that uh, as a visitation with a pastor during the course of the week. Or we've got some uh, female pastors now, especially in the, among the millennial group, and they they have the, a place, they have a status, they they belong in the ranks of the pastors, and they're not, they're not treated any differently. 
uh, than any of the other pastors, but we have a rank of, of female ministers coming up, and sometimes they don't understand and engage with, they want to eat with a pastor at lunch like any respected professional. And it, it miffs them a little bit to think that the pastor's wife has to come along. And they don't understand that, that, that as pastors, as any Christian men, as any Christian period, we are held to a standard, friends. Amen? We have got to be careful where we're at in public. We don't want to be a stumbling block to those that are around us that may, that may think otherwise. The book of Romans chapter 14 and 15, I've been really eating on that, those chapters lately. I just love that. It talks about judgment and, um, and being careful about not being a stumbling block to your brother or sister in Christ. And we have got to do what we can. We got to do what we can within our power that's reasonable. And friends, what we see up there on that, on that screen is part of that video clip. Things were beginning to unfold and an adulterous relationship is almost ready to unfold. And, and she's crying out when she receives that text, text message. When Elizabeth Jordan receives that text message, she cries out to God. In a prayer and in a moment of desperation saying, God, I, I need to turn loose of this situation. God, I'm out of control and I want you to be in control. God, I am desperate. That's a prayer of desperation. Friends, the trials of life can push us towards God. You know that? The trials of life. Many of you have been in a trial in your life. Some of you are going through a trial right now. And what's, what's happening, I can almost say with certainty that most of you are being pushed towards God, not away from God. Because when we go through trials and, and hardships in our life, those trials and hardships will thrust us towards God. And so trials come into our life that that can be a good thing because our relationship with our Heavenly Father is deepened. Trials of life can push us towards God, friend. Desperation can deepen our prayer life. Uncertainty can deepen our prayer life. The destruction that may come against us can deepen our prayer life. Even fear can deepen our prayer life. Friends, the enemy may thrust us into these things, may thrust us into destruction and into fear, into confusion, but these things that are brought into our lives can only make us stronger because we go from our five-minute devotion time into maybe 30 minutes of prayer. That can only be a good thing. When all of these things are coming upon us, when our life is falling to pieces, when announcements from a doctor come, come to our ears, it only drives us deeper into God and into prayer time. These things can be a good thing for us, friends. Yesterday, we were splitting wood as a family. We found a, a friend has an old tree, and we're chopping it up and splitting wood. And at first, it was just Judah and I we went out there for a couple of hours, just he and I together. And he's a little bit intimidated by the wood splitter, right? We've got a little motorized wood splitter. We're splitting some wood, and he had never run it before. He never really even seen one before. And we're taking him out there, and I said, Judah, it's, it's no big deal. It's real easy. I said, the mall moves up and down real slow. There's no danger to it at all. But he's not convinced in his mind yet until he gets his hands on that machine and all he does is stand there and move that lever up and down. Until he gets engaged with that, he doesn't know what's, what's happening, what's going on. So what is Judah engaged in? My son, he's a little bit uncertain. He's even fearful. These motorized contraptions, he doesn't know what exactly is about to happen. He asked me how to, to generate, how, how to operate it, and I showed him. I didn't give him something to operate without having an, an opportunity to instruct him. There's teaching, and the Heavenly Father teaches us how to engage in something new. Even though we may be uncertain, even though we may be fearful, the Holy Spirit guides us and shows us how to operate things in the spiritual realm. Obviously, there were some logs that Judah could handle. And there were some logs that he could not handle. And those moments that Judah could not handle, those, those larger logs, we had to kind of roll them into place, roll them into place on that, that old splitter. Guess who had to help? The, the father had to help Judah roll those things into position. Judah looked now at, the, at those logs and they're saying, Daddy, those, those logs are too big. They're too heavy. There's nothing that I can do. I cannot do this in my own abilities. And so dad has to come along and help out. Now I'm positioning it in the splitter and Judah's running the lever up and down. We work together because there's some things we can do in our own strength. And once that fear and uncertainty has passed, we can move on. 
But then a big log comes along and we have to kind of wrestle with it, don't we? A big trial, a big problem, another uncertainty because now Judah is again fearful. Judah is now again uncertain. What do we do? We have to rely on the Father to defeat this, this giant problem. How do we bust this big old log up? How do, we, how do we take this stump and chop it up? We take it one chunk at a time. We have run that splitter up and down several times, busting off a section here and a section here and chunking it down until it's a nice, usable size. The Father can deal with your fears. The Father can deal with your uncertainties if you only ask for the Father's help. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is a simple conversation between you and God. There are things you can do in your own strength. But there are certainly things you can't do in your own strength. You've got to ask the Father. God, I, I'm uncertain right now. I've got some fear. And God, I've got this situation in my life. And God, I want to give it to you. I want you to show me, Lord, how to get through this. And the Father doesn't ever really step back and just hands off. The Father's always around nearby. The Father's always watching, watchful, making sure everything's safe and comfortable. The Father is always there to guide you and to guard you, and at times to take over. And that the, the cry of Elizabeth Jordan's heart was, God, take over. God, this, this situation is too big for me, and I've got fear and uncertainty totally consuming me, and it looks like my, my life, my marriage is coming to a point of destruction. But God, I want to fight for my marriage. God, you're going to have to wrestle this giant thing into the place where we can, we can split it. Me and Judah, we work together. Judah stepped back, and then I would work the, work the log a little bit, wouldn't I? I'd work it myself. But you know what? Then I had Judah come back around and say, well, I may be wrestling this huge log, but what you're going to do, you're going to run that lever up and down. Judah never, I never wanted him to be totally hands off. I wanted him to be totally engaged in the process even if it was a less of a process, running that little lever up and down at his ability during those big ones. And we're going to have big ones in our life, friends. And God's not going to say, hey, totally step back. God may want you to be a little bit engaged in the process. Hey, let me guide you through this, God says. I want you to stand here and just run the lever up and down. Just keep doing what you've been doing, Right? Judah's been running that lever up and down all morning long. Just keep doing what you've been doing. And so that's what the Christian, Christian faith, the Christian walk is always about. It's just keep doing what you've always been doing. Even though uncertainty and fear may come into your life, you don't give up what you've been doing. You don't give up on your prayer life. You don't give up on your Bible reading. You say, God, I don't know, but I'm going to keep doing because I don't know what else to do. I'm going to keep doing my reading. I'm going to keep doing my prayer time. I'm not going to give up. Friends, prayer does not have to be long. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out prayer. Sometimes we are scared of praying because it's going to be uh, something that's going to rob us of our time of the day. We value our time. Time is the only commodity that we can spend that we'll never get back. You can never buy back more time. Once it's spent, it's spent. It's gone. And so oftentimes, as Americans, we think that once that time is spent, we'll never get it back. But friends, Time spent with God is the most precious commodity you will ever have. Time spent with God is the most important time that you can have. It's the most important. Time spent with God is not a waste of time. It's the best time you can invest in yourself. The prayer doesn't have to be long. Jesus even said that here in this passage of Scripture in verse 7. He says, I don't want you to pray going on like the, like the pagans do. Babbling on, he said. Babbling on like pagans. Pagans, these, these pagans here in Jesus' time, they simply recite prayers and chants repetitiously. Friends, doing repetitiously, repetitious, meaningless prayers is junk. It's junk. Repetitious religion doesn't get you anywhere with God. God wants conversation, not repetitious prayers and chanting. Sometimes we think that we've got to do 10 prayers in order to get God's attention. Before, then he'll answer our prayer. That's nonsense. We think that we've got to fill a piggy bank with God in order to curry his favor. That's, that's a lie. 
God just wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from his children. He wants to hear from his son and his daughter just having a conversation. God wants to be with you, his, his children, friends. We know that story is illustrated with Elijah there in the Old Testament. And Elijah was going to call fire down from heaven upon the sacrifice. And he gave the pagans the first crack at it, didn't, didn't he? All, all the Baal worshipers. What did they do? All morning long, they danced around in circles, chanting, crying out, cutting themselves, trying to invoke their God to bring fire from heaven. And it never worked. Repetitious prayers didn't work. Didn't work for the pagans. They're not going to work for Christians. God desires conversation with you. Friends, God's not interested in quantity. He's interested in consistent quality. He's not interested in quantity. He's interested in consistent quality. I've used this illustration last fall when we're watching football. I can sit down and watch a Denver Bronco game for two hours, for three hours with my son, with my daughter. They enjoy that a little bit. They get a little bored. You know, they're still young. They can't make it through a full game just yet. They kind of bounce around. They like being with dad. Dad's in the same room, but dad is engaged on the screen. The kids are just kind of engaged everywhere else. What would be more meaningful to my kids? Me sitting with them watching a football game for three hours or me playing catch football with them for 30 minutes? It would be much more meaningful for my kids for them to play catch football with me for 30 minutes because the kids then know that they've got dad's full and undivided attention. And it's more meaningful to my kids to have that. They laugh, they giggle, they're having more fun at that moment than if they were to sit with dad watching football for three hours. God is not interested in quantity. He's interested in quality. Quality of time. This third point today tells us and encourages us to pray like a warrior. Elizabeth Jordan right now, she's crumpled up on the bottom of her closet and she's upset and she's distressed. Hearing the words come across her phone on that text message troubles her spirit. But then the warrior comes out in her. And people of God, if you can understand the heart and spirit of the warrior, you can emerge as a powerful man or woman of God. Understand the heart and the cry of the warrior. And sometimes you have to have everything taken away from you before the warrior comes out. I pray that's not the case because we can develop warriors before we have to have everything taken away. But sometimes God has to get our attention. Everything has to be stripped away. And then the fighter comes out. See, sometimes the worst of things in our life brings out the best spiritual side of us. Because it takes a fighter to come out to say, this far and no farther. Sometimes we have to be pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until we will finally be broken to the point where we will respond to what God has been asking and calling his people to do. And that's to pray. To be a people of prayer. Friends, we've got to pray like a warrior. Friends, spiritual attacks will make us or break us. Either way, it's good. Spiritual attacks by the enemy will make you or break you. And either way is okay. Because they will either make you, they will make you stronger spiritually, or they will break you down to the point that God can finally start working on you. So spiritual attacks will either make you, they'll make you stronger, or they will break you. And they will break you down to the point where the Holy Spirit can finally get past all the callousness of your heart. To be able to finally get you to a submitted point where God can deal with your life. Spiritual attacks, friends, will make you or break you. And either way is okay. Friends, you've got to pray like a warrior. Friends, you don't have to take the enemy's attacks lying down. What do you do in times like this? You've got to memorize and quote war verses. Memorize and quote the word, friends. You begin reciting God's word back into the enemy's face. He can't do anything but run away. First thing a warrior has to do is get mad. The Bible says to be angry but do not sin. 
We need some angry Christians that are angry about what's happening in our nation. We need some angry Christians that are angry about what's happening in our community. We need some angry Christians that are angry about what's going on in their family. Get mad. Get a little bit angry. It's okay. The second thing the warrior does is he gets mean. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 tells us this in the King James Version. It says, for our weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Have you ever went up against a stronghold and just played patty cake with it? Nothing happens. You've got to get mean to pull down strongholds. That means you've got to have the fight of the warrior, the heart of the warrior. You've got to be merciless. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Be merciless, friends. The Christian cannot take any prisoners when it comes to dealing with the enemy. You deal with him and you deal with him concisely. The next thing of the warrior, the key of the warrior is to never say die. Never throw in the towel. Never quit. Never say die, friends. The Bible says to after having done all, to stand. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. After having done all, to stand. Some of you are at the end of your rope because you've done everything you know to do. The Bible tells us to stand. Keep standing. Keep doing what you've been doing. If you've been doing in prayer, what you've been doing in God's word, keep it up. Never say die. Lastly, the warrior must resist the devil and he will flee. We mentioned that, James chapter 4, verse 7. Friends, if you don't resist, then the devil is going to continue to settle in and torment you further. Either deal with it now or deal with it later, but you might as well get it done now so you don't have to continue to keep suffering. It just makes sense. Deal with it, friends. Deal with it. Quit letting it sit there. Quit letting it pester you. Quit letting it fester on you. Deal with what the enemy has brought into your lap and get it out of your head. Get it out of your, out of your life. Resist the devil and he will flee. Some of you need a little bit of a lesson in resistance. You've been raised up in a pacifistic environment, either in your home or in your community or in your nation. God did not call his people to be pacifistic. God called his people to war, to make war against the kingdom of darkness. Don't let the enemy settle in and torment you further. The enemy, friend, is not comfortable around prayer or praise and worship of God. So you don't want the enemy to be around you. Engage in prayer. Engage in praise and worship. Turn that Christian radio station on. Put on some praise and worship music. Begin to, to inspire the environment around you. Allow God to begin to work. Some of you are constantly belly aching about your trials, but you have not yet resisted the devil. Friends, it's always easier to complain than to resist. Just ask the Hebrews in the wilderness. They lived 40 years of complaining in the wilderness. It was a lot easier to complain than it is to fight. I understand that. We see that commercial on TV. It talks about the easy button. And they're, they're pushing that, that like that's a good thing. Easy button, just hit the easy button, we'll do it for you. Friends, nobody's going to fight your spiritual battle for you, but you. You can't hit the easy button in Christianity. It doesn't work. There's no such thing as an easy button in our faith. God is calling the warriors and the fighters to stand up and grow a backbone and take down the kingdom of darkness. Resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the enemy being the key point there. Friends, complaining is not resistance. Complaining maintains the status quo. If complaining was to actually tear down the walls of, of the kingdom of darkness, then the kingdom of darkness would have been defeated a long time ago. But it's obvious to us today, complaining maintains the status quo. The Hebrews, all they did was complain and complain and complain. They're in the wilderness. They belly ached and they complained. The status quo did not change. Put on the mind of the warrior, friends. Do not let the enemy deceive you. Let's stand this morning. Would our prayer team come today? Hallelujah. Some of you are going to be engaged in an altar call here in a few moments. Because this message today may have inspired you to say, God, I need you. 
I need you to help me deal with this big issue. God, I've been standing here just looking at it and belly aching about it for so long. But God, now is the time. Today is the day where this issue needs to be placed under the blood of Jesus Christ. God, I need to be set free. I need to have the chains broken. God, I need to set this into your hands. God, I want you to take control. Friends, God intended his people to fight in prayer. Not to be pacifistic to the enemy's advance. What is it that is rattling your cage? What is the enemy stolen from you? Every head bowed across this place. Like Elizabeth Jordan, has the enemy robbed you of your joy? Has the enemy robbed you of your marriage? Has the enemy robbed you of your family? Has the enemy taken your peace? Friends, warfare is not for the faint of heart. God did not save you from a life of sin and slavery just for you to be defeated in your spiritual journey. God wants to raise up mighty champions and warriors for him. What is the enemy doing to rattle your cage? It's time to take up a position of advance. It's time to take up solid footing. It's time to take up the sword and the shield, friends. It's time to take up your prayer position. It's time to go to your knees. It's time to take a prayer walk. It's time to sit in your pickup truck and pray. Your belly aching doesn't, doesn't do any good. It doesn't bless God. It doesn't bless the people around you. Dig in, friends. Press in, friends. This morning, if you're here saying, God, I need some prayer. God, I want to engage in prayer. God, I want to be the warrior that you have called me to be. God, I need to get mad. I need to get mean. God, I need to be merciless. I need to never say die. God, I need to resist the devil. That's you this morning. I just encourage you to fill these altars today. Come to these altars. Come to this place of prayer. Come to this place of power. Come, warriors of God. What is the enemy doing to rattle your cage? You need to answer a call saying, God, I'm committing to you today, God, that you would move me. God, that you would make me into a warrior. God, that you would improve me. God, that I want to give my, my belly aching to you. I want to give my belly aching to you, God, and I want to start fighting. I want to start fighting the good fight. God, I've been pacifistic. I've been, I've been taking the lickings. And God, I'm weary and I'm tired. God, I want my joy back. God, I'm feeling my, my family's been robbed. God, I want my peace back. I want the Prince of Peace in my home and in my life and in my soul. God, what would you do? God, what would you do today? God, would you help me to roll this big old log into place? God, can we split it together? God, what can we do? God, what can we do?